There's big oil earnings in them thar hills on this energy edition of Industry Focus. Greetings, fools. Sean O'Reilly joining you here from Fool Headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia. It is Thursday, February 4th, 2016, and joining me to talk oil earnings and credit downgrades are Tyler Crow and Taylor Muckerman. Uh, so, guys, Super Bowl this weekend. I know who Taylor is rooting for since he has a Carolina Panthers flag at his desk. Yes, absolutely. But uh, who, do we think, who, who do we think is going to come out on top? Panthers. Of course. Yeah, okay. against the spread. Against the spread, that's, yeah. that's a bold bet. What's that's, the spread right now? Isn't it like five and a half? Last I saw was that's it? six. Six. Wow. But I mean, that's a pretty that that's a pretty decent sized spread. Yeah. Do you guys think this is uh, Peyton's last shot? I mean, this is it. Uh, yes, because uh, I don't depends know if he's on gonna... how many HGH deliveries go to his wife. I don't know. Ooh. I don't know if he's finishing this Low game blow, on Sunday. Bro. Low blow. Yeah. Well, let's see. Uh, my, I, I have a weird shot in front of because I think it was like la- a couple weeks ago. Who was it? CEO of CBS, was it? Les Moonves, was like really like excited as heck on how much it's gonna like cost per thirty second Super Bowl ad. I really, really want to blow out. Wasn't it a couple of years ago? It was like two or something. Yeah. Like this is so I really want to blow out just to like kind of stick it to him a little right. bit where yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. he charged so much for a Super Bowl ad and this year since you had a blowout nobody, nobody watched, watched finished blowout. the entire yeah. game that's fine he got his Yeah, they still had to pay they don't get a refund that is true come to think know. of it I kind of get some you you might get a little uh, pay, a little pay more for the first half yeah advertisements and I know you, we're supposed to be talking oil stuff. earnings but what's up with the pre-release of all these Super Bowl of ads? the Super Bowl game <laughs> yeah <laughs> the pre-release of the we know who's going to win um, no, there was like that Mick Jagger one or whatever. Or the it's like and I saw an avocado. Yeah, commercial. Like, wait, wait, wait. Was like, this is half the reason people watch the yeah. Super. Like, what's? Anyway. Yeah, it almost kind of takes plot twist. A decent amount, a decent portion of Super Bowl watchers only watch it for the commercials. I know. And if you release them all on YouTube I was like, beforehand. What are you doing? You're kind of spoiling the moment. Well, it's like showing it. a movie on a bootleg copy from before it gets released yeah. in theaters. Maybe it's not their best one. Maybe they're just feeling got the feelers out. Oh my god! Oh, I go. didn't think the Super Bowl commercials last year were all that great, anyways. No, so they weren't. whatever. No. Pre-release all you want. All right, so we are finally getting fourth quarter and full year 2015 earnings from the oil majors, everybody's favorite corporation. Uh, so I thought we'd go around the table and talk about the company that we each picked pre-show. Who wants to go first? Well, alphabetically, I think mine might be first. Okay, go ahead. BP. BP. Yes. Profit. Beyond Beyond Petroleum. Way beyond petroleum. <laughs> they, they, they should move as far away as possible. Yes, get away. Abandoned ship. Profits down 91% Ooh. year over year for the quarter. 51% down for the full year. Um, their market cap is the lowest it's been since the Deepwater Horizon disaster. It's below $100, million, $100 billion. Now, leverage buyout. Leverage buyout, yeah, something now, like to that. To be fair, Maybe though, Maybe Shell's mean, got some extra cash Yeah, right. Around. No, they don't. <laughs> to be fair, if you look at the financials of BB during the Deepwater Horizon spill, the financials were actually okay. Oh, they I mean, were it was great. making yeah. money. Well, because they were talking about spending $15 billion on that. I was like, okay, that's fine. Like, whatever. <laughs> and, then, yeah. and this time, it actually, you know, there's a reason. <laughs> well, their net loss is almost double the loss from 2010, and that's the same year that they wrote off $40 billion worth of assets. Wow. So, yeah, things aren't that great uh, over at BP. Um, they saw that they pretty much said that they've cut costs almost to the bone. So We cannot cut it anymore, there's, Captain. <laughs> there's not much more room. <laughs> did refining uh, help them at all? Like, what's? Uh, well, it did a little bit, but you're seeing... Uh, yeah, um, I mean, let's see. I got their refining numbers right here. In the third quarter of last year, so 2015, they did 2.5 billion in, for downstream refining and chemicals, and then this in the fourth quarter it was 838 million. So, so that's not even. Well, yeah, they're, big they're showing like downturn. Lack of demand is hurting them on the margin side from Yikes. from the downstream sector, and it, and it results in job losses. At first, they were only going to lay off 4,000 upstream folks. Now they're talking about that plus 3,000 downstream folks. So, wow, you would think those guys would have been is, uh, isolated a little bit, but you, that's the, the idea behind the just the diversified model of a, of a EMP with your downstream business, but not helping them right now. Nope. Okay, so I picked Shell. Who did you pick? I did Exxon Mobil. So okay, you're up next. I'm, I'm, I'm up next. next. Yeah. So, I, I here's the only thing I guess we can say is 
at least were profitable. I mean, well, just, yeah. if you compare to what happened with you know BP and Chevron both heading into the loss column even before like asset write downs and impairments, just on a pure earnings basis, they both lost money. ExxonMobil actually made money. You know, it doesn't sound that great, but hey, it's something, right? Um, total earnings were or earnings for the quarter were down fifty seven percent compared to this time last year, and let's remember. Fourth quarter of 2014 wasn't exactly killing it either. Yeah, no, uh, for no, any, we're getting any into company. a pretty easy comp. Yeah, and area still right not we're quite still getting not. over the think. hurdles. <laughs> One would think that these are pretty easy comps to do. Um, kind of the same stories though. Uh, <clears throat> uh, upstream production uh, profits down somewhere between 85, 80 percent. Uh, downstream didn't suffer as much as BPs. They pulled in about 1.3 billion dollars on the downstream, which pretty you know pretty much propped them up. Um, and you know the funny thing is for almost every single quarter, quarter in, quarter out, ExxonMobil always talks about investing through the cycle and prudent capital allocations. And one of the for the very first time in probably a very very long time, they actually talked about on their conference call of. Living within their cash flows, which is kind of something you never hear from Exxon Mobil, so it was kind of almost surreal. Because normally they would have been like, "Well, all the, the time, that, sheet, we can, yeah, yeah, all the time they normally just say we need to keep on investing through the cycle. We'll get through this, yada yada yada. More strength. debt, yeah, more. We got to keep that dividend. We'll figure it out. And this this quarter was uh, one of the first quarters in a long time where. Their cash flow from operations didn't exceed right. uh, their investments, so now they're starting to talk about whispers of, "Hey, maybe we need to think about reevaluating our our s- investing through the cycle." Even Papa Exxon's sweating it now, huh? A little bit. Yeah. Okay. Well, as I mentioned, I did Shell. Um, the uh, you know we obviously chatted about them recently, so I was curious what was going on with their earnings. Um, they are of course about to complete the big BG Group acquisition, and that complicates matters a little bit going forward as well. This is going to be the last quarter and the last report that we get before the acquisition goes through. Uh, fourth quarter 2015 earnings on a current cost of supplies basis. I'll define that in a minute if anybody wants to. Uh, were 1.8 billion compared with 4.2 billion in the same quarter last year. So, like Tyler mentioned, uh, we're starting to get into some easy comps, and it still did not matter. Um, still tough to chew. The uh, I actually never heard of the current cost of supplies thing, even though I took plenty. It's of a very classes. European thing. Yeah, BP, it is. BP uses that too, but basically yeah. just net income. Yeah. So basically, the bottom line for our listeners that don't know or don't care is it's basically similar to what U.S. majors report as net income. So whatever. Um, full year 2015 earnings were 3.8 billion compared with, wait for it, 19 billion in 2014. Oh, oof. Womp womp. Um, yeah. Anyway. Uh, they're still going strong with the dividend. Um, they expect they're expected to announce a dividend of forty seven cents per ordinary share and ninety four cents per American depository receipt uh, for the first quarter of twenty sixteen. So they're still keeping that going. To be fair, though, um, they do have a very large uptake on a script dividend program. Ooh. So if you look at their actual like cash outlays for their dividend, it's down almost forty percent um, because what they're doing is allowing people to. Take a dividend in the form of new shares. Oh, that's and, shenanigans! And um, <laughs> I, that's how I all my shares that have the eligibility. Really? Yeah. I just reinvest yeah. my dividends. I mean, for anybody that's doing to do reinvested dividends, it's actually a pretty good deal because most companies, when they do it, they do a five. They give you a five, discount, give you a 5% or... market uh, discount on the new shares. Yep. So they they're having a pretty large uptake on their script dividends, so it's helping save a little bit of cash. I think it was like a little more than a billion a quarter right now. So a lot of people are taking advantage of this down, downturn in a little bit of a small in a small way. Say that. Yeah, I mean, I mean yeah. dollar cost average without even doing anything if you right. I mean, yeah. you're not buying full shares unless you own a like, crap ton of stock. Right. But um millions upon millions. Yeah, cuz your dividend is is small compared right. to the price of the shares, but um yeah, you're still adding a little bit over time. So uh, this stuck out to me, um, and we're going to get to this in a minute. But uh, Shell was one of the companies that Standard and Poor's downgraded. So I'm wondering if they should be cutting the dividend. Um, they cut Shell's credit rating uh, along with the rest of the sector, and you obviously talk about that a little bit. But they just did it specifically in Shell's case because the company has been able to uh, unable to cover its capital spending in dividend payouts from cash. Um, so starting to dip into the the balance sheet and stuff a little bit. Welcome to the club. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, my last little tidbit that I wanted to point out, and Tyler, Tyler, feel free to weigh in here. Um, 
interesting thing that stuck out to me was they did not do so well on their reserve replacement metric. Um, its reserve dropped 20% in 2015. Um, Shell, of course, said that low oil prices forced it to slash 1.4 billion barrels from the volume of its oil and gas that it expects to develop. And um, Chevron was able to re uh, replace reserves last year, for example, up to 107%. So it was kind of disappointing to me to see that, but anyway. What were we saying on our way down here, Tyler, though, that so, it, it's price dependent? Right, yeah, right. Right. Reserves are not just the amount of barrels of oil that you find or cubic feet of gas that you find. It's also if you can extract it economically at a set price, and the, the price is typically set by the SEC yeah. um, on a trailing 12-month basis. So, like, if we were to compare last year's reserves for Shell, um, they were probably doing it at a barrel price of 95 maybe even better versus today you know you're looking at a per barrel price of over the past 12 months probably in the mid 50s 50, yeah so um so what that's going to is... that's going to affect your reserve replacement thing but it doesn't change the physical amount of oil right. in the ground so who knows maybe in you know three four five years we see oil back up much higher than it is today It'll be very fine. easy to replace those reserves. One thing we can conclude, though, is Chevron clearly found some cheaper oil, given well, their reserve replacements. We'll see. We'll see? Okay. All right. Before we move on, I wanted to get to uh, our point out to our listeners of the newly resigned Focus.Fool.com, where you can take advantage of a discount on the Motley Fool Stock Advisor newsletter that works out to $129 for a full two-year subscription. Once again, that is Focus.Fool.com. And moving on to our second segment, that did not take long. Um, everybody remember a week or two ago when Taylor said he was watching to see the next company to cut its dividend? Huh, what? We have a winner. It yeah. is, drum roll please, ConocoPhillips. All right. Uh, who saw this coming? Anyone? Um, did you mention this as a possibility? Not, not as no. Well, no, yeah. no, I didn't. I, I thought certainly. you might see um, a weaker candidate, maybe like a, a leveraged master limited partnership or something like that. But then again, none of them are reporting for it's a couple of It's not over yet. Yeah. Not <laughs> over yet. I mean, they're not the Plus only ones. Plus a lot they're of them just have cut already. The so. first one yeah. to do it. Um, it caught, caught me by surprise because like just a few months ago, ConocoPhillips said, Paying the dividend they said was, like fine, their, yeah. was like their highest priority use that of cash. Was, that was what I was going to say. Which was also a red flag because. He lied like a central banker that's like the night before no, 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 no. That's like financial engineering to me. Like, I don't want my company thinking the dividend is like the holiest of all grails. Right. I want them it to- It should be a leftover thing. Yes, like I want a, them to be saving. I want them to be spending. I don't like put right. the cash where it needs to be as part of this business is concerned. Don't so, cater to investors. They you know, did keep the dividend. They cut it by two thirds from 74 cents a share to 25 cents. I mean, is this just to placate people or- Well, you, you, you know, they didn't reduce it to one cent. So right. I still think they're just that's placating. To, yeah, that's placating. That's <laughs> that's making sure that you don't get dropped from mutual funds that are right. yield focused, because um, mm -hmm. then you get a lot of sell off. But uh, I think this is probably just more of a strategic move, obviously. But at the same time, you, you can't come out in November or December and say your dividend is like the most sacred cow in, in, within the company, and then two months later. Lack of credibility. Is now. Well, he, he, they weren't the first one to do it. I mean, no, if, no, if, no, if, was... if we remember, I, I think it was uh, Kinder Morgan, like yeah, back yeah, when absolutely. they reported third quarter. You just had to bring up Kinder Morgan. Well, third quarter in like <laughs> October, they're, they're always like, we're going to protect the dividend. Yeah. The dividend is fine. It's safe. And within two months, cut yeah. uh, as the you know everybody started seeing those debt and fears refresh my memory the the credit ratings and S&P raising questions was the cause of that initially well, right yeah like they they got they did an acquisition that brought on a yeah. little bit more debt and they were already kind of uh levered pretty high after the big buyout that they did and they were running higher debt metrics in the first place and so after that acquisition everybody started going hey guys your debt's getting a little uncomfortable we're not ready for this can we find some cash somewhere to do it so um it's it's almost kind of funny it seems like every single company nowadays is coming out with that the dividend is sacred and we're going to protect the dividend but at all costs and then a month later it's cut how sacred can and how safe can a dividend really be in a cyclical industry That's right like, uh, don't don't put such a high value on it as a company when obviously there are going to be struggles so what were you saying earlier about the Philip 66 spinoff, uh, Tyler, and how it, I hope everybody kept those shares, right? <laughs> so 
back in 2012, uh, ConocoPhillips spun off its refining and chemical segment into Phillips 66. Uh, and the idea was it was going to unlock shareholder value. You know, Phillips 66 was this underappreciated asset on the balance sheet. And, you know, we're, we're trying to properly allocate capital and all that stuff. And so they spun it off thinking, oh, it's going to be great because we'll take all that cash and reinvest it in shale. And it's going to be wonderful because all this expensive oil is going to, you know, let us do a killing. And uh, lo and behold, uh, it, we're they coming, were right, we're coming to find <laughs> out that actually owning a downstream asset in a um, cyclical industry is a pretty valuable asset to own. I mean, if you look at both Phillips, uh, ConocoPhillips has since the merger or the spinoff, it's down 31%. And similarly, Marathon Oil, which did something similar with Marathon Petroleum back in 2011, they're down now 70% since the merger or since the spinoff. So, you know, there is value in being in an integrated major. There is Not when <laughs> oil is $120 a barrel, though. Yeah. Which is when well. these guys decided to cast off their refining business that probably wasn't doing so hot at the time. It's like they forgot they were in a commodity business. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> They've been sniffing the petroleum reserves. Um, okay, so moving on. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, S&P downgrades... Um, all the energy things? Is that <laughs> what we're calling all, 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 all the things. The whole, the whole, all the whole tool shed. It's all getting downgraded. Just thrown out. Um, Standard & Poor's has downgraded pretty much every uh, official corporate credit rating in the oil and energy patch. It took rating actions on 20 different issuers in the oil and gas exploration production segment. Um, why did it take them this long? That's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and here we are in February 2016. Well, I, I think one of the reasons is if it took so long, if you look at the companies that they downgraded, they were the ones that were doing okay and you know had the yeah, balance sheets to manage. This is basically just an industry downgrade. Yeah, it's I not mean, like company specific anymore. Yeah. When they come out with that large of a number, it's like, yeah, well, you guys are all pretty much up at the creek. Yeah, <laughs> when you're when you're downgrading Chevron and Exxon Mobil, yeah. I mean, back in 2015, yeah, things didn't look hot because it was oil was sixty dollars a barrel and they were taking some write downs. But the cash situation was still doing okay and stuff like that. But now things are getting a lot tighter, and now they're, you know, after a year when it's time to re up on those uh, reassessments, the time came. Right? Well, after like at some point, Exxon had a better credit rating than the U.S. government. Still does. Still does. So there you go. Ooh, awkward. This seemed to imply <laughs> that. Uh... Everybody's sweating you now because you heard about Saudi Arabia issuing those bonds a couple of months ago, and now they're talking about selling Saudi Aramco, so they're not happy. They're cutting their social programs and all that good stuff. Well, I mean, that's the same as... They did say that they can live in this environment a lot longer than most. Well, yeah, Saudi Arabia. but then they're they, going to run out of money. They have a very large reserve. <laughs> yeah, but in five years, they'll be five out years, of Five years, if oil is still $30 a barrel in five years, we're all out of money. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Okay. Before we head out, I thought we'd do something fun. If there is there one piece of investing advice that you could give a listener right now, uh, what would it be? Taylor? Don't let double digit percentage moves to to the to the good scare you away from investing in energy right now because stocks are still down fifty, sixty, seventy percent. Me personally, I was just telling you guys before the show that console energy is a company I've been watching uh, to add some shares to. And in the last 12 days, it's up about 80%. But in the last year, it's still down 70%. Right. So, a lot of, lot of room to go cool. for it to get back to where it was. Yeah, that's one of the things that's kind of underappreciated is when somebody says, oh, they're up 25% over the past two days. We're like, yeah, well, you know, to gain everything You're back, they have 90. to be up like 400 <laughs> yeah, or 500%. Exactly, yeah. So, um, the one thing I would say to people, especially... This is a long, we're long term investors. We're trying to buy in businesses, quality businesses that you can hang on to five, 10, 20 years. In a commodity business like this, we don't know the bottom, we don't know the top, and it's impossible for anybody to really time it well. So, why Even the bother? companies themselves, because the obviously no themselves. one was beating the pulpit trying to tell right. us that this was going to happen. So, as an investor, pick the companies that are great companies and are going to succeed over those long term time horizons. And just keep investing through the cycle. Some sort of like, you know, the reinvestment program where like you do it at regular intervals, and it, you will gain the benefits of the bottom, even if you don't necessarily, you know, call the bottom. You know what I mean? It, it, 
buying at regular intervals like that or dollar cost averaging, whatever you call it, it sucks. It's hard. Right now, you want to hold your nose when you're trying to make investments in the energy space right now. But it works. It's it's been proven to work for a very very long time, and I think investors that can, you know, hold their nose and actually make those investments today will really benefit five ten years from now. Um, and in that spirit, I just want to highlight the importance of not getting caught up in the herd mentality. Um, that is that's how you get trampled to make it as corny as possible. Um, this nobody here at this Way table. Way to throw that and, pun in. That well, one. you know. Um, nobody at this table, and I doubt any of our listeners have ever done this, but I saw this thing on um, Bloomberg.com uh, yesterday, and it was short interest in oil futures is at an all-time high for like all of human futures history. And I was like, you're doing this at $30 a barrel. Where were you $70 ago? Um, and that applies to everybody selling right now in quality names like Accor Labs or something. I mean, what... What do you think? You know, do not do something because everybody else is doing it. It's like the folks at the end of a, of a somewhat of a blowout. They're like slowly getting up out of their seats and yeah. that final touchdown score. Then it's a mass exodus. Yeah, and then like, the team comes back to win when you're in the parking lot. Yeah. Oh, it was like what was it? NBA Finals Heat Spurs a couple of years ago or something like that, where it was the Spurs were blowing them out. Yeah. And the entire arena emptied out. Empty. And but the the Heat made a. Big comeback. And there was and one guy there. there people banging it. on the doors <laughs> yeah. trying to get back into this game because they're like looking at their phones and they couldn't get back in. It's like, well, you just missed one of the greatest games in NBA history because you decided that it was already over. Don't so be that the, guy. The investing advice is never bet against the Heat in the last, I don't know, minute. What do you mean? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. that Heat team. This Heat <laughs> team, team bet team, against. Yeah. Well, fine. LeBron left. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, guys, that is it for us. As always, if you have any questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. Just email us at industryfocus at fool.com. Again, that is industryfocus at fool.com. As always, people in this program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against those stocks. So don't buy or sell anything based solely on what you hear on this program. For Tyler Crow and Taylor Markerman, I am Sean O'Reilly. Thanks for listening, and Fool on. <laughs>